Okay, so um, today uh, we will continue our discussion of tidal effects in binary systems. And um, I first want to remind you kind of where we, are, we were at yesterday because we stopped um, at the point where we had derived an action in, or in fact you had rigorously derived it um, in the tutorial for Newt Newtonian tidal interaction. And um, we discussed a little bit about how to make this into a relativistic result. So let me just remind you a bit uh, where we were at at that point. So we had um, in Newtonian, and let's say, just um, let's just discuss the quadrupole uh, up to quadrupolar order, but it can be straightforwardly extended to any multipole. So we had this action principle, which was. Um, for the binary. This was uh, the orbital part um, for point masses. Um, plus then this um, interaction term, uh, dt minus one half, then the coupling of the quadrupole to the tidal field, um, plus the internal Lagrangian depends on Q, Q dot, could be higher derivatives. Um, and that depends on what model you assume for, for this quadrupole. Um, and this was now for a point mass with an extended body companion, specialized. Okay, and um, we also said that in the adiabatic limit, uh, adiabatic response, adiabatic response. So for a tidally induced moment, qij is minus lambda eij. So it's just linear proportionally to, proportional to the tidal field. Um, so this is what we said. And then I claimed we could just um, take this action and make it into a relativistic result with some small modifications. So the first thing we had to do is to figure out what Q and E mean in general relativity. And um, let me sort of remind you of the setup we were considering um, for the binary system. So we had an extended object A here and um, we sort of uh, defined a region around it um, where near this body A, it, it was um, its local neighborhood. Then there was a buffer zone um, at larger distances from A. And then way uh, over here was body B. And say they were separated at a distance D. And the radius of um, this object was r, let's say. Radius or diameter, it doesn't matter. It's just to say the, these length scales are very separated. And so um, the point is that in this zone, we have to use perturbations, f fully relativistic perturbation theory, uh, so perturbations of relativistic objects. We cannot make the approximation that there are weak fields or anything, even though, you know, first, first we did a lot of calculations in Newtonian theory, but now um, we want to go away from that and just say this is how we can calculate things in that zone. And then, because the bodies are widely separated, so we say here post-Newtonian expansion of orbital dynamics. So, and post-Newtonian, you know, means small corrections, relativistic corrections to Newtonian binary dynamics. This is just the more general picture. So yesterday we didn't discuss how the, this kind of picture, but we had a similar setup where we had a separation of these length scales. And um, yeah, so the point is that um, here, 
for, for, to compute the orbital motion, we saw that all we need are these multipole moments. And the information that now comes from this strong field region are just these parameters lambda in, in this approximation. So th this, this will give us lambda. And um, you will see sort of this afternoon for a Newtonian um, star how, how this lambda comes out from doing, relative, well, Newtonian perturbation theory, but it uh, can be done in, in this, cut, this region near the body. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, in, in this zone, of the, so we also saw yesterday that this body A, because it's extended, it has both its own multipole moments, QIJ, and it has some tidal moments, EIJ. And those tidal moments um, are now in um, GR. They are defined, let's say, again, we are working in the body's local frame. So in A's local frame, which means if we're considering in this zone here, uh, local frame, EIJ is some components of the curvature tensor um, in, in certain Fermi normal coordinates, but yeah, you, ju you should just appreciate that this can be um, gotten from the curvature. And um, it's also sometimes called um, a gravito electric field. And that, that's also why it was denoted by curly E. And, um, okay, a new effect in GR that comes in, um, or maybe let, let's. Uh, yeah, so in, because um, this curvature tensor also has, of course, it has four indices, so you can also form other, uh, another combination of it that is um, the analog of a magnetic field. And um, that's the gravitomagnetic. Um, so gravitomagnetic also exists. And that, that has no Newtonian analog, so we're not so familiar with it. Um, so in the local frame of the body, this is given by bjk is equal to one half, and then it's like a curl um, epsilon jpq, and then again the curvature tensor pq k zero. So here, this curvature tensor is due to to the companion due to b. Because as we showed, the motion of, of one body or these tidal moments are only from the other body. So we, we usually showed in Newtonian this, this uh, was minus mb di dj 1 over r uh, d, d in this case, what was the Newtonian uh, result that we had. Okay, so, so this is now a new effect that comes in in GR. It has no Newtonian analog, but there are many analogies with um, magnetic field in electromagnetism. So it will induce current, current moments. It induces current moments in the star. So, so you could have, um, instead of couplings like QE, you could have current moment coupled to this um, gravitomagnetic field also. So we won't consider the, those details here, but just for you to appreciate that there are also new effects that come in. Okay, finally, now I didn't yet say how the moments are defined. Again, they are defined in this um, region around the body itself by considering the asymptotic metric. So we wrote in, in certain, in ACMC coordinates, 
near A, but far, but um, for uh, distances much larger than the size of A, um, we had we can write the, for example, time time component of the metric as minus one minus two some effective Newtonian potential that that is sort of an analog of the Newtonian potential, and then this U effective from from this we could read off uh, the multiple moments. Well, so Q over R cubed and uh, blah, 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 and so on. It's always the multiple moments divided by R to the L plus one. Um, yeah, so, so in principle, this U could also include the tidal field because it's, it might be, but here it's just um, defined in, the, it's only the potential due to the body itself. And, and this defines Q, defines Q. So the idea is you have to um, work, yeah, basically this is what I said, that uh, lambda comes from this region. You have to work out Einstein's equations and the perturbed fluid equations in the zone of the body um, match an exterior solution to an interior solution, as you will do um, this afternoon for a Newtonian case to see how this is done and how you can then extract information about these multiple moments and hence the love number if you assume Q is minus lambda E. Okay, then finally I said we can write down, uh, now we know how to define Q and E in GR, um, and then what the remaining part that's left to do is simply, okay, we have here this coordinate time dt, but um, in general relativity, you're supposed to be invariant under all reparameterizations. You might choose maybe proper time or uh, some other evolution parameter. So you have to then ensure that um, the, this action is invariant if you put a different evolution parameter here. So we said we put uh, this kind of um, four velocity dot product, which is sort of an analog of the redshift factor, or which reduces to the redshift factor if you use coordinate time. So S is equal to S orbit, so say GR. S is, again, the orbit for point masses. Um, plus, now, um, integral, let's say the evolution parameter is called sigma. Then we, we put z, which is now the redshift. Um, and then the similar coupling, minus one half qij eij plus L internal. And th this shift factor was defined to be square root minus u dot u. And u was, um, so this was uh, body A was supposed to be on a world line z mu of sigma. And the four velocity was the uh, derivative with respect to sigma of this. So u mu was dz mu d sigma. Okay, that, this is a bit formal and um, yeah, we're not really going to go into more detail about it um, because, yeah. Um, just to be aware that you see with just a, f a few modifications, we can uh, directly get a relativistic result that's um, very analogous to the Newtonian case without doing much further work. And um, as I said, in, in addition to having these kinds of couplings, you can also now in GR couple to the gravidomagnetic field. So you have induced current moments that couple to the gravidomagnetic field. Okay. Um, so now uh, the question is, okay, 
we've sort of cheated a bit in deriving this result because um, we simply transcribed it to the relativistic case. But you might ask, OK, maybe in GR, there could be some new interactions that come up that are not these kinds of tidal interactions that might be important. And in fact, it, historically, um, that was what was claimed. So in um, 1995, there were a series of uh, five papers by Wilson, Matthews, and Marionetti, um, or some subset of these authors. Um, and so what they could do was they had a, the best um, numerical relativity code at the time, which didn't allow them to yet make a full in-spiral evolution, but they could um, solve the initial data, pro uh, initial value problem, and just compute equilibrium sequences of binary neutron stars in full general relativity. So 1995 was the first one. And um, so it was called uh, instabilities in closed binaries. Okay, um, so there was a general relativistic, they claimed, they, what they found um, as a result in their simulations was that there was a, a general relativistic crushing force that doesn't exist in Newtonian theory. It's a purely uh, relativistic effect. Um, and that would cause the neutron stars um, during their in spiral or uh, during some uh, equilibrium sequence to collapse to black holes. So it um, causes neutron stars to collapse to black holes during in spiral. Okay. So this, this was, um, yeah, they, as I said, they wrote five papers on this um, new effect that they found. And um, in the community, there was, of course, people tried to check it and reproduce it. But um, the problem was that the code that this group used was the most sophisticated, and it could use um, realistic equations of state, not just some polytropic equations of state. So in fact, um, if, you're really, if you're interested in this, um, there's a sociological account by Kenefick um, about sort of what, what uh, was going on in the community. And um, because this, this was kind of in, this new force was kind of in disagreement with all kinds of post-Newtonian estimates or um, people who didn't really know where it came from, this new force. So there was, people were suspicious, but others were very excited because it's a new effect that could have profound implications on gravitational waves. So Kenefick wrote an account on this called um, Star Crushing. Um, theoretical practice, it's just a sociological account, but it's quite interesting uh, to read. So practice and uh, the theoreticians regress. It just um, analyzes, you know, what do you do in such a situation? There's a claim of an interesting new effect. No one can really check it. Uh, it's in disagreement with all kinds of expectations or uh, analytical estimates. So finally, um, Okay, now I erased it, but finally, um, um, so Ena Flanagan wrote a paper, um, Flanagan, um, called uh, General Relativistic Coupling Between Till um, Motion, Motion, and internal degrees of freedom. Uh, for inspiring neutral stars. 
Okay, so that's a really nice paper. It's very technical. Um, so basically what it does is considers exactly the setup that um, I sketched on the board earlier where you have um, two bodies and you have a, a fully relativistic region around them. And then um, you, you do um, an approximation for the orbital dynamics because you have the separation of uh, length scales and you do a rigorous matched asymptotic expansion calculation to show um, the following. So, so again, um, here the setup was the size of the objects are. So then you have um, the system is characterized by, by different dimensionless parameters. By dimensionless parameters. I should say, okay, okay um, there were many analytical works, but they all used um, in this region, they didn't have the fully GR region, they had um, a post-Newtonian approximation for, for the self-gravity of these objects. So then um, these uh, believers in the star crushing force always argued, well, since um, you, you don't have the genuine GR effects in this region, um, your argument doesn't really rule out this new force. So um, here he identified these, um, okay, and these are of mass m, let's say. Um, so epsilon is m over r, which characterizes the internal gravity in the object. And then there's um, the tidal, uh, tidal expansion parameter. Uh, alpha is R over D, um, which characterizes the tidal expansion. And then uh, there's an orbital parameter is M over D, which is also can be written as epsilon alpha, which is the PN expansion, so post-Newtonian. Okay, and so the reason is once you have these um, dimensionless parameters, you can write down perturbation expansions adapted to each region. For example, this epsilon parameter is um, very strong in, in this region, you, so you shouldn't make an approximation in epsilon. But for example, this tidal expansion, you can expand in, in the region where you're assuming that D is much larger than R, and so on. So, uh, so he showed match, uh, with matched asymptotic expansions um, so and all orders in epsilon so in the internal gravity but uh, for for alpha less than one, much less than one, alpha small. Um, and um, non-spinning objects, because um, so when objects are spinning, of course, the, the body dependence of the equations of motion is different because you can have spin-induced multipole moments. So this was um, also non-spinning, which was also the same case that they did in the numerical simulations. So he found um, no uh, GR non-tidal interactions. So that means the tidal, inter yes? Where are you doing the 
Um, so uh, near this buffer zone, usually. I mean, so usually you write down um, your um, approximation in each region where it's valid, and then you, you have to show rigorously that there is an overlap domain where both expansions are valid, and in that region you do the matching. So, the, so this can be quantified. Once, once you have your perturbation expansion, then you can find the overlap domain. And um, body dependence, which means uh, that f the effects of the structure of the bodies, um, body dependence in the equations of motion starts at order, order alpha to the fifth. But the deformation of, of the object starts already at lower order, but it just once it influences the binaries. So if you have a chance to look at that paper, he has a, also a nice table of where all these effects come in and so on, but it's quite technical. But basically, so that, that this um, basically said, no, there's no such thing as this crushing force, even in GR. And um, so it turned out finally that there was a slight inconsistency in their code. So once that got corrected, uh, this went away. So, so this gives us confidence that this action that we wrote down with just the tidal couplings here, this is the leading order effect in the binary for non-spinning cases. And then, of course, there might be magnetic effects, but they are much smaller. Any questions? Um, yeah, I mean, according to current knowledge, yes. I, um, if you, with all these approximations, um, and yeah, I mean, if you take reasonable fluid bodies, uh, yeah, that, that's all I can say. I mean. It's not, not completely ruled out in all cases because maybe, but this gives us a lot of confidence because that was kind of a very rigorous setup of the calculation and that it showed that tidal interactions are the only way that finite size effects come in, even in GR, um, for non-spinning non objects. Okay. so. Um, now, um, I want to go back to the Newtonian case, or let's say uh, here in, in this region, do the post-Newtonian expansion of orbital dynamics to leading order, which is a more fancy way to say, it. but in the end, it's just Newtonian. Because, um, so yesterday on the worksheet, there was also the last problem to work out the energy of circular orbits in a binary system, but maybe many of you didn't get to it. So I wanted to go through it and then um, go a bit further also because um, in the first lecture this morning you already heard about the quantum pole formula for the energy law and the orbital decay. So um, I now wanted to go through the calculation of how tidal effects influence the quantities. And then eventually this will lead us to effects on the gravitational waves themselves. So let's go back to our uh, binary dynamics. And as before, we, we have A is an extended object, B is a point mass, and um, A has only a quadrupole, only quadrupole. And that quadrupole is tidally induced. Okay, so we had the action again, which was dt and then the point mass orbital part in the uh, relative coordinates, one half mu v squared plus mu m over r. Um, and then the quadrupole part minus one half qe um, plus l internal 
which, uh, okay. And we said um, that normally we should take L internal to be sort of the harmonic oscillator, uh, one over four lambda omega naught squared q dot squared q dot squared uh, q dot minus omega naught squared q squared. Okay, um, where omega naught is the F mode frequency, fun fundamental mode frequency. Okay, omega naught is F mode, L equals two. And F means fundamental. So next week you will talk about all these kinds of oscillation modes that uh, uh, a, a neutron star can have. And, um, but now this is a bit complicated, so we instead take the adiabatic limit where the quadrupole is non-dynamical, simply um, linear response to the tidal field. So Q dot will go away. So we take this to zero for adiabatic. So then the internal is just one half of this but with the opposite sign. So we have S adiabatic is again integral dt one half mu v, v squared plus mu m over r um, and then plus uh, lambda over four uh, eij eij. I've already used um, that Qij adiabatic is minus lambda Eij. Okay, and that's, that's the nice thing now, because now the action depends only on orbital variables. The only way information about the object comes in is through this parameter lambda. And um, so we have many times we've now calculated it. So I hope you almost remember it already. So it's n STF divided by r cubed. And um, there's this identity, but you can also work it out yourself. Um, if you have an STF unit vector tensor and you contract it with another one, um, it gives L factorial times 2L minus 1 double factorial. So this is now e lets us easily compute what this EIJ EIJ is what we ha that we have here in the action. So we have um, EIJ EIJ is equal to 9 mb squared 1 over r to the 6 times 2 thirds. Because if I take this for E i j is L equals two. So I just specialize L equals two. So I have two factorial, two L minus one is three. Three double factorial is just three. So I get two thirds. So that even makes things not even simpler. So then the action just becomes um, a function of R explicitly now phi dot and r dot. So, um, and now uh, plus 6 mb squared over r to the 6 lambda over 4 because I had this prefactor. That seems simple enough. Um, okay, so now we want to consider um, motion of a binary and uh, we'll take it, it to be the orbital plane theta equals pi by two. So motion in the plane 
theta equals pi by 2. So that means this v squared will just be r dot squared plus r squared phi dot squared if you use um, r phi coordinates to parameterize the orbital dynamics. So, okay, I guess it's clear, but just for reference, let me write it down. Okay. Um, so then we can substitute this for V, and now um, either vary the action to get the equations of motion or, you know, just say, okay, this is in brackets, that's a Lagrangian, so I can just use all the Lagrange equations. And so now we first write down the equations for R. So um, let's say Euler Lagrange. So I have to take d by dt and the derivative of L with respect to R dot is just 2 R, um, uh, 2 R dot, uh, mu R, R dot. And then uh, dL by dR, I have to differentiate this and here this uh, part from the velocity. So um, I have minus mu R phi dot squared plus mu m over r squared, um, and then the tidal part plus 9 mb lambda, 9 mb lambda over r to the 7 is equal to 0. So that's the first equation. Okay, it's clear, good. Um, then for the equation for phi, you see the Lagrangian is independent of phi, there's just dependence on phi dot. So I have to take d by dt of um, mu r squared phi dot is equal to zero, that's all. This now describes the motion of the binary. So for, um, now we want to further specialize to stable circular orbits. And that means that r dot is zero and r double dot is also zero. So stable circular orbits. r dot is zero and r double dot is also zero. Okay, I should say the dot indicates a time derivative in case that, that wasn't clear. Okay, and then let's uh, expand out this equation. So we get here uh, r dot phi dot plus r squared phi double dot is equal to zero from this. And you see, if I put in this equation, okay, this is a double dot. If I put in this equation, if I set r dot equals to zero, it means automatically phi double dot has to be zero. So phi dot is a constant. So, and that constant I'm calling omega, the orbital frequency. So this means, uh, yeah, phi double dot is zero. And from that, I can just choose phi dot to be uh, a co constant. Okay, that, so now we're left with this radial equation. And um, yeah, so you see in, for circular orbits, this term will go away. And the remaining term will give us a relation between phi dot, which is now omega, and r for, for this orbit. And this is what we want to work out. Because in the end, we want to express everything um, in terms of the frequency, because, okay, in Newtonian it doesn't matter, but in GR it actually matters that um, 
things like the orbital separation, they're gauge dependent quantities. So it's not a good idea to express results in terms of these gauge dependent quantities. But frequencies are observable quantities, and so they're gauge invariant, or more or less gauge invariant. And so we always want to express things in terms of frequencies if possible. So let's go to this radial equation now. Let's say we divide out this mu r, r to, get, to isolate phi dot, and then we get the relation between phi dot squared and r. So we simply have then phi dot squared, which is omega squared, is um, simply m over r cubed. So let me, let me say r double dot, dot equation gives this, this relation, m over r cubed, plus now a correction due to tidal effects, mb squared lambda divided by mu um, r to the 8, because I've divided by mu r. And um, you see from the first term you recognize Kepler's law, but then there's a correction due to the tidal effects. Okay, but as I said, we want to go the other way. We don't want omega as a function of r, we want r as a function of omega, because r is the quantity we want to eliminate. So, uh, we want to solve <laughs> r of omega. And so, how do we do that? Well, we say, um, we say, now we always work, the, we always, um, we say the tidal effects are small, you see, if um, they scale, for example, here as 1 over r to the 8th power, and we assume they're widely separated, so this is already a small effect compared to this Kepler's law. Um, so, uh, work to linear order in tidal. So we set r equals r0 times 1 plus delta r, and this delta r is the tidal correction. We just say this is um, what we want to assume. It's almost um, the r of omega that comes from Kepler's law, but then there is a small correction. And now we have to solve for what the small correction is. So we substitute into this relation what this is, and expand to linear order in the tidal effect. So if, if we substitute, what do we get? So we get omega squared is equal to first m over r0 cubed times, um, well, then, so basically I now substitute here for r cubed r0 times 1 plus delta r, and I expand for small delta r essentially. So I, m over r0 cubed, 1 minus uh, 3 delta r or something like that. Um, and then for the second term, this is already linear in the tidal effect, so I, do, I don't use any delta r there. I just use r0 plus uh, um, plus, 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 uh, 9 mb squared lambda over uh, mu r0 to the 8. Okay, and, um, okay, I haven't introduced formally a small parameter to do the perturbation expansion, but you see here, this is a title term, this is a tidal term, so first, when the tidal terms are zero, I can solve for r of omega, so no tidal. <coughs> I get um, omega squared is equal to m over r zero cubed, so r zero is the usual m to the one third, omega to the minus two thirds. So this is simply obtained by saying 
okay, this is a title, a title, so I set those to zero, see what I get, I solve for R zero. And linear title, so I get simply um, that this must be zero, so um, nine MB squared lambda over mu R zero to the eighth um, has to be equal to 3m delta r over r0 cubed. So now I can solve for delta r, so we can already cancel out, uh, I guess, here, we can make it a 5, and the three, 3 we can cancel. It, so maybe I should say, so this I obtained simply by saying, on the left-hand side, we just have a term that has no tidal contribution. So if I'm looking at linear tidal order, the left-hand side is zero. And then I just look at that right-hand side, that might, must also be zero, and that's how I got this relation. So, and we can also substitute for what R zero is in terms of omega. So finally, we get a relation um, delta r equal to 3mb squared lambda divided by mu m to the minus 8 thirds um, m to the minus 8 thirds omega to the 10 thirds. Okay, this comes because here, R0 to the fifth, you see, gives omega to the 10 thirds, uh, or one over. And then um, this m factor, okay, here we also get m to the 5 thirds, but we have this m factor that we have to divide by, so um, this is what we find. So this now gives us R as a function of omega. And the next thing is, um, to apply this, or to solve for the energy, the binary as a function of omega. So maybe let, let me just summarize um, what we have here. R of omega is now m to the one third, omega to the minus two thirds, one plus the tidal correction, which is um, 3 lambda over mu mb squared m to the minus 8 thirds omega to the 10 thirds. Just by, by because we have to find uh, r to be r0 times 1 plus delta r. Okay, the next thing is the energy of the binary. Okay, so this um, we also worked out. You can refer back to your tutorial from yesterday. You worked out what the energies were in, effect, in fact. So um, the energy was, what um, we found was it's one half mu v squared minus mu m over r for, for the center of mass relative motion. And then we had the correction from tidal interactions, three mb squared lambda over two r to the six. Then we just put a note referred to yesterday. And um, so now the next thing is to specialize this to circular orbits and write it as a function of omega. So we now specialize to circular. So um, E is um, one half mu and V in the circular case becomes just R squared omega squared. So um, R0 squared 
And then I linearize again in the tidal field, in the tidal um, deformations. So I have to do full R squared, but I'm saying R is Kepler's uh, law plus a small perturbation squared. And I just lin truncate to linear order in the perturbation. Um, omega squared uh, minus mu m over r0. And then I have, again, the correction term, um, 1 minus delta r in this case. And then I have this last tidal term where I just put r0. I don't include any perturbations. And b squared lambda over 2r to the 6, r0 in this case. OK, I, here maybe I make the note linear tidal. And then all we have to do is substitute our previous results for r of omega. OK, uh, maybe I'll leave it to you to do all the algebra, of, but it's pretty straightforward, right? We had the expression for delta r here. We had r0. So one just substitutes in here and everything explicitly in terms of omega. And um, so finally, we get e of omega is equal to minus one half mu m omega to the two thirds. Um, okay, one moment. Uh, okay, so I already wrote it in, if, as a fractional correction, but again, that's fairly straightforward to work out. It's a bit of algebra, but nothing uh, very complicated. And b squared, lambda omega to the 10 thirds divided by mu m to the 8 thirds. So you see also as sort of a check on, on calculations, you see whenever we compute fractional corrections to the leading order motion due to tidal effects, we always see omega to the 10 thirds coming in. Here also, omega to the 10 thirds. Any questions for this? OK, so we will keep this result over here because we will need it later to compute the orbital decay and eventually the gravitational wave phase, but maybe not today. Um, so the next thing is, you already saw this morning the quantum pole formula for the energy emission to gravitational waves. So now we want to compute explicitly what this is in terms of um, the binary we are considering. So, so dominant gravitational wave generation. Um, or, yeah, uh, yeah, E dot gravitation wave, so the energy or the negative of the luminosity of gravitational waves. Um, okay, quadrupole is quadrupole. So this is the general formula minus one fifth, um, and then QIJ. Three time derivatives, qij, three time derivatives contracted, t. And um, so this is how it's usually written because it comes from, you know, really solving uh, the linearized um, Einstein's equations for the metric perturbation uh, due to a source. And then here these angular brackets indicate that um, you're supposed to take an average over several wavelengths of the gravitational waves because 
this gravitational wave radiation is only defined in um, regions where you can separate the, um, the um, space-time into a piece that's uh, slowly varying and some rapid oscillations that are the gravitational waves. So, but for now we can, we don't really need these brackets, so I will eliminate them because they might confuse you with the STF uh, projection. So, okay, so notice I put a T on this QIJ because, um, so this is to indicate the total quadrupole of the binary. Um, so QIJ T is the QIJ from the orbit, or let's say I call it orbit, but what I mean really is point mass, or the center of mass motion, or maybe, yeah, so, some, something that indicates really what, what you would have for point masses, um, plus the QIJ that we have on the one object. So it's really the total quadrupole moment contributes to this um, radiation. And this was here, this was the tidally induced one. And we um, previously computed what this was. So let me just remind you, QIJ was minus lambda EIJ, and EIJ was uh, minus MB the IDJ one over R uh, minus lambda MB the IDJ one over R, and then this could be written in terms of these STF um, tensor. So it was three lambda MB N STF over R cube. This was what we had by now many times, but just to remind you, this is what we're assuming. So we're saying this is the tidally induced quadrupole moment of the object. It's minus lambda E in our approximation. So we write out what E is. It's this, as we had previously, and then we use that it's um, explicitly equal to this part. And um, the orbital part is very simple, QIJ orbit for the Newtonian piece. Of course, if there are post-Newtonian corrections, it gets much more complicated, but then you also have additional contributions to this energy loss formula. So this is simply mu r squared and then STF tensor of Nij. So that's, that's very nice because as you notice, both of these quadrupoles have this Nij STF. So we can simply factor it out. So we have um, the total quadrupole is then equal to nothing but, um, so if you factor out Nij, then we have um, mu r squared, uh, mu, mu r squared from the orbital contribution plus three lambda mb over r cubed. And let me just call this quantity. Q. Just for um, later reference, because now the next thing is we have to take three time derivatives of this thing and then contract it. Um, so to, to take time derivatives, um, so first of all, we are, we are working for circular orbit. Uh, so let me just find you r dot zero. Um, so you see when we take time derivatives of this QIJ, we don't have to differentiate this Q because it will generate terms proportional to R dot, which will be zero for circular orbits. So the idea is, you know, to differentiate this and then each, uh, then each time eliminate second derivatives with the equations of motion, but here we are specializing to circular orbits, so we can eliminate all terms that will uh, give R dot. So all we have to do is take three time derivatives of this n. And to do that, it's um, very uh, uh, good to remind ourselves of some, some uh, coordinates or what it looks like explicitly. So n, as, as we said, it's a unit vector in the orbital plane, so it's sine phi, cosine phi, zero. 
And um, it's useful to introduce now another ve vector that's orthogonal to n and that's um, proportional to the velocity, so in the direction of the velocity. So useful because, okay, you, so maybe some of you have done this calculation for um, if you just want to compute the energy loss from the quadrupole formula. And of course you can do it if you write out this as a big matrix and then you just take time derivatives of each component. But here we want to avoid that and instead um, do, do it in a slightly different way. So useful to introduce phi, which is supposed to be another vector. Um, it's in the direction of the velocity for circular orbits. V, which is um, R omega phi i, is simply the definition of how, how we define this vector for circular orbits. And then we can have some useful relations, or maybe let me first write down what this phi looks like in coordinates or in components. Um, so then phi i will have components minus sine phi cos phi and zero. Okay, so then we have the useful relations that n dot i is equal to, well, you can almost, if you compare the two, you see up to a factor of phi dot, which will be omega. These are almost uh, the derivatives of one another and up to some minus sign. So n dot is going to be omega phi i. and phi dot i is minus omega n. And also, you can convince yourself that these are orthogonal. So n i phi i is zero. So these are the identities we have. So that's, um, now we don't have n itself, we have this n stf. So let's remind ourselves what this actually means. So this was simply the symmetrized part of n, i and j, minus one third delta ij. Okay, so, and we see if we take a time derivative, the, the derivative of the delta will be zero, so we just have to consider this part and differentiate. So now we can just go ahead and uh, differentiate. So let's say Q triple dot total ij is equal to, so when I take uh, derivatives of these n vec two n vectors, I will get a factor of omega phi each time, but with two indices, I mean two different, phi, one is for i and one for j. So I will have um, Q triple dot is, so this Q factor, which uh, defined here, which we just carry through because it's a constant. Um, then if I have d squared dt squared of, um, then I have omega phi i and j plus the other combination. Okay, sorry. I. If I use the real phi, uh, the non-script um, phi, please uh, see, uh, see it as the same because sometimes I use a different notation, phi j and i. Okay, that's, that's what we have. So next, um, we take another derivative. It becomes a bit more complicated because I have to act on phi that gives me n, n gives me minus phi always up to factors of omega, and similarly here. So I get Q omega d by dt, then I get all this mess in the square bracket, but it uh, will combine, so n i n j, because if I differentiate phi, I get minus n up to omega. 
if I differentiate n, I get phi. So plus omega phi i phi j. Again, similarly, plus omega, if I differentiate phi, I get minus n, minus n i and uh, n j n i. And then if I differentiate n, I get uh, phi plus omega uh, phi j phi i. OK, as can be really simplified, 2q omega squared d by dt of uh, phi i phi j minus n i n j. I've just uh, combined these factors. OK, so now we have to take one more derivative, which we now can do easily. Um, so we get again a factor of omega 2q omega cubed, and then differentiating uh, phi will give again minus n, n i phi j minus the other indices phi i. And then again, if I differentiate n, I get phi, so I get again some combination of n and phi uh, minus n i phi j minus uh, yeah, minus nj phi i. OK? So, um, OK, let's continue on this other side. So let me write down what we have so far. So qij, third derivative of the total one, is equal to minus 4 omega cubed because I, I just uh, collect all the factors. This Q factor that was um, dependent on the point mass part, and then and the tidal part, and then I have N and phi, basically just symmetrized, NJ phi I. Okay, and now I was supposed, any questions so far? Okay, so now I was supposed to contract the two Q, I, uh, so, E dot, I just erased it, but okay, it was E dot gravitational waves was minus one fifth. Um, then I was supposed to contract two of these third time derivatives. Okay, and we um, had this useful identity that n phi is zero, and okay, we have the additional identity n i, n i is one and phi i, phi i is also one. We can fairly easily contract this with itself. Okay, so it's uh, minus four omega cubed over five. Uh, no, I have to square it. <laughs> so my, I take two of these prefactors, so minus 16 omega to the 6 q squared divided by 5. And then I get ni phi j uh, basically contracted, okay, um, ni phi j plus ni phi j nj phi i plus uh, basically the same thing, plus, yeah, same. Okay, I've, I've just multiplied these out, the square. Okay, and um, so we know here n, n, phi, phi with the same index, this is going to be one. And then here we have n, phi and phi will be zero. This will be zero. And then here the same, we have again plus one <laughs> from, from the same part. So finally we have minus 32, um, okay, let me just check that it's correct. Mm, yeah, so far minus 32 omega to the six. Um, okay, I didn't, 
uh, write it out. Okay, when over five. Um, okay, and um, yeah, now I'm going to substitute for what this Q factor is. And again, if if I take Q squared, I'm going to linearize in these tidal uh, contributions. Okay, so I take the orbital contribution squared and then a, a cross term orbit tidal and the tidal squared I'm going to neglect. So um, this, um, then I have mu squared r to the fourth plus six mu mb lambda divided by r. Okay, so now we're almost done. The problem is we still have R floating around, so we want to eliminate it in favor of omega. Okay, um, so now we substitute R of omega. And again, we see, you know, the orbital part, we substitute R0 plus delta R. In the tidal part, we just use R0 from Kepler's uh, law. So we get finally E dot gravitational waves equal to minus 32 over 5 omega to the 6 mu squared R0 to the 4, 1 plus 4 delta R plus this tidal part mb lambda over r0. Okay, then I erased what r and delta r were, but you can look back in your notes. Um, well, this r0 was m to the one third omega to the minus two thirds, but this delta r, uh, you have to look up. Um, so finally, what you get is 32 over 5 mu squared m to the 4 thirds omega to the 10 thirds. And then, okay, let me continue on this line below because uh, it's 1 plus 6 mb lambda over mu m to the 8 thirds, omega to the 10 thirds, again, as it expected. And then um, we have now 1 plus 2 mb over m. And basically the point was, um, so now we have here this uh, different dependence on the masses because here you see in the energy flux when we solved, we had only mb. But if you look back at what we had for delta r, it depended on, for example, mb squared. So there was a slightly different dependence on the masses, so we have now here a more complicated correction term, but it's not, it's not so bad. Okay, and this is a prefactor is meant to multiply this whole thing in square brackets. So this is already quite nice. Now we have a result for the orbital energy and the radiation in gravitational waves, uh, energy loss. So um, the last thing we'll solve today before ending is um, the decay of the orbit. Okay, so orbital decay. due to gravitational waves. So, um, well, you heard this morning in the binary pulsar, um, it was the decay of the orbital period that was observed. And so similarly, we will now consider the change in the orbital frequency, which can be converted to the period, of course, just by two pi over the period frequency. So I want to compute d omega dt. Due to, due to this gravitational wave emission. And um, this, uh, because we have now E of omega here for the conservative dynamics, we can even write this as 
äh, die Omega, die I, die I, die T. So it's basically um, E dot, gravitational waves, divided by the E, the omega. So this is now what we want to solve for. What are the tidal effects on this quantity? So okay, we, we have E dot gravitational waves right here. We have E of omega here, so we have to differentiate, um, which is okay, not so difficult to do. Um, so, um, okay, let's maybe compute it over here. So, the ED omega is equal to, okay, the first term is minus mu m to the two thirds divided by three omega to the one third. Okay, that's uh, simple enough. And then the second term, okay, we have to see, so we have omega to the 12 thirds there. So if you work it out, you find 18 lambda mb squared omega cubed divided by m squared. Um, and I will write it simply as minus mu m to the two thirds divided by three omega to the one third. And then one plus, let's say, big delta. And this big del delta is simply um, whatever, when I factor out this point uh, mass term out of this thing, this is um, what this delta means, and it's explicitly given by minus 54 mb squared omega to the 10 thirds divided by mu m to the 8 thirds. All that happened was because I can compute derivatives more easily if I factor this ex out explicitly, which is what I did here to compute the derivative, but then I refactored it again. Okay, so this is uh, what we have now. And let's also say this is called uh, delta E dot. So then we can first of all say, okay, we again want to linearize in the tidal effects. So we just keep uh, small corrections. So we have, um, okay, for, first let's see what the point mass term is. So from um, E dot, we have minus 32 over five mu squared m to the four thirds, omega to the 10 thirds. But then we have to divide by the ED omega. So mu m to the two thirds, three omega to the one third. So um, uh, then times three omega to the one third with now a plus sign. Um, okay, uh, divided by mu m to the two thirds. And then for the correction terms, um, I know from E dot, I have to take this delta E dot, one plus delta E dot, and then I have minus delta from down here, minus delta. Okay, now it's a lot of algebra to, to well, not really a lot, but a little bit um, to work out Final answer, but you have all the ingredients. You know, delta E dot is given right here as this tidal correction term, and delta I wrote down over there. So finally, you should find um, that this is 96 over 5 um, calligraphic m to the 5 thirds omega to the 11 thirds times 1 plus 6 mb lambda divided by mu m to the 8 thirds, um, then m plus 11 
mb omega to the 10 thirds. Okay, and um, okay, this calligraphic m is the trap mass. Trap mass. It's given by um, mu to the three fifth m to the two. And it's um, basically once we compute the gravitational wave phasing, this is. Uh, where this quantity will appear at leading order usually. And um, one more thing I wanted to mention uh, is, okay, now we, we've always done the computation when we have just one extended object. But you, if you have a neutron star, double neutron star binary, you have, of course, two extended objects. But because We've always worked to linear order in all these tidal effects. We can just add the contribution from the companion. So for two extended objects, we get uh, d omega dt is equal to, OK, again, 96 over 5, um, chirp mass to the 5 thirds omega to the 11 thirds, one plus um, six over mu m to the eight thirds. Let me also factor out omega to the 10 thirds. And then I have um, mb lambda. Now we have implicitly always had a label A on this lambda because we considered body A to be extended. So I'm now going to put lambda A here, um, M plus 11 MB. And then plus, I just take the same thing except I flip A and B. So I just have M A lambda B and then again M plus 11 M A. Um, yeah. So this is the final expression, and um, you see. Okay, we we will see tomorrow. Um, to, yeah, tomorrow or Friday um, for the gravitational waves. Well, you can almost uh, compute the phase approximately from this um, this information. But again, there will be a similar situation where you have a correction that scales as a high power of the frequency. So it means it becomes important only when the bodies are very close and moving at high orbital frequency. Um, also, there is a suppression factor with the mass. So if the total mass in the binary becomes very large, this tidal effect also goes away. And then there's some combination that involves masses and these tidal parameters of each object. So if you're measuring gravitation waves, you, of course, you don't disentangle immediately these individual contributions. You just measure one tidal effect, and then uh, you have to sort of figure out, um, yeah, it's a, a diff difficult problem. Um, yeah, so you, you can um, sit down and think of all the possible corrections that could come. So if you go back, yes, as you said, we made this approximation that uh, there's a separation of length scales between the body scale and the orbital scale. Um, so you could work out the nonlinear effect, but you will find that it's extremely small because it will be roughly uh, the omega to the 20 thirds if you, if you um, consider two quadratic order in these tidal effects. But you could say nonlinear effects, so Maybe it's best seen if you, you consider uh, the Lagrangian we had. So we had something like uh, that was proportional QIJ, EIJ plus L internal. So nonlinear effect could add by, um, OK, one half was it. I'm not going to worry about factors, just to say sort of the structures you could have. And then nonlinear effects, you would say you have maybe QIJ, Q. J, K, Q, K, I, with some coefficient. 
but of course, it, it also it's important to know what is the coefficient because that sort of sets the size of these effects. And then you can work out what is that effect. You can include um, these dynamical tides where you have the F mode frequency included. So you have a kinetic term for the Q. You, you can have higher multiple moments that might contribute because if the bodies get closer, those higher moments might become important. Um, yeah, so you have to really th sit down and think of all possible effects that could be there and then try to work out to estimate how big they will be to see if there is anything else that might come in. Yeah, so that, that we can uh, determine by comparing with numerical relativity simulations because they can compute really the strong field. They solve simply the GR and hydrodynamic equations, and so they just, just compute everything without approximations up to numerical errors and the, up to the physics they put in, of course. But then we can compare with the simulations to see how well the linear tidal effects match what is seen in the simulations. Um, yes, yes, this has been tested. And it's found to work um, fairly well, except uh, at, at sort of um, larger separation. But then as the bodies approach more closely, then um, it seems like the dominant effect is to take into account this F mode um, oscillation, that it's not really a static uh, deformation. But there is some approach to a resonance. But uh, yeah, that's, I mean, uh, and then, of course, when the bodies get really close and they have already come into contact, then also this approximation doesn't work anymore. And then we also find the models don't agree very well with numerical simulation. 